everybody. Welcome to Grace Church. On this Sunday, and maybe you knew it, maybe you didn't, but it's our 36th anniversary. And uh, so Grace Church is uh, starting, actually we're starting our 37th year today, but we're 36 years old, isn't that right? That's right. And uh, I want to welcome everybody in the room. Plus, I want to welcome everybody on internet and everybody on radio right now, and that's all over the place. But I want to give a special welcome, you know, to everybody that sits in overflow right now, overflow number two right now, and then we got people up on the mezzanine right now. And so I know it feels maybe like you're in timeout or something, but you're not. We're all in the same building together with the same Holy Spirit, online, on radio, and in the building. Plus, all our kids are back in Treehouse, plus youth groups going on. Hey, I'll take it. We got a full house. So thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, it's a great day to celebrate what the Lord has done with us for 30. Can you believe it? 36 years. 36 years ago, we met 17 of us. Um, we were both way too young. And uh, she was one month from having our third child. Uh, we had no money, no name, no church, no nothing. But we had the Lord. We had his word. We had 15 other people with us. We met at Banks Lock Shop. And we didn't have a clue. We didn't have a denomination behind us. We didn't have a mother church sending us out. We didn't know about Calvary chapels or nothing. We didn't know nothing. Except I knew if we just keep preaching the word, focus on Jesus, I didn't know if it would work or not, but I knew that's what I was supposed to do. To, to let you know how unprepared we were, that I was, not your fault, mine. You know, I was teaching through the book of Hebrews to the youth group of the church that we had to leave. And so, uh, probably in the history of mankind, no church ever started, started in the middle of the book of Hebrews. We did, because that's where I was. So, we just picked up in case you don't know, Hebrews is like one of the most difficult books in the New Testament, but that's where we started, and God blessed us anyways. And uh, my Cindy is still married to me, which is amazing. Well, <laughs> the stories we could tell, Pastor Bill's crazy. Uh, one I can tell you, I did the math last night. Uh, if you add it up, 36 years, it's approximately 9,000 sermons. 9,000 sermons. And I still get nervous. I'm nervous about this one again today. And you say, why? Well, because that's just the way that rolls. But see, what she wouldn't tell you, no, wait, did you count all those sermons you preached to me? And so seriously, there's another 3,600 <laughs> sermons that she listened to twice or a week. <laughs> and uh, so, and then Cindy did this. She's so gracious because if you're a pastor, then you get this. But like, for 36 years, you know, we're going to get in our car as we drive home together. And then I'm going to say, well, what do you think? And then whether it's true or not, every week she says, oh, it's really good. It's really good. She never once said that one just, you know, flopped or sunk or out the window. She never said that once. And then I've always received that from her, even though I know it flopped or whatever. So that's all true. Anything you want to throw in there with that? No, you don't. See, she's so gracious. Because I'm a wise woman. You're a wise woman. Yeah, I, 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 so. I do know this. In heaven, she's going to have a crown so big you won't see her. Because, and then people say, well, why did she get a crown that big? She's married to Bill. <laughs> so. Why don't we give thanks to the Lord? Cindy, would you pray with us? Pray with me, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to mostly just thank you for your faithfulness to us as a young couple not knowing what we were doing, to the group that was around us that came with us, and how you were faithful to in each and every one of our lives. As one of the songs said this morning, your, your faithfulness is all over our lives, just taking care of our families. Um, our churches, it grew, and people moved away, and new people came, and all the different buildings we were at, and you were always there with us. I thank you just how you protected us. Thank you for even all that had to happen for us to get in this building, and 
taking us through COVID. And I just praise you and thank you so much just for your faithfulness to us and to this church and how you show your love to us every day. We thank you for today. We pray that you would be with us today during this service and with Bill as he preaches and open each of our hearts to receive what you have. In your name we pray. Amen. Can I, can I see the picture of Cindy and I? We haven't changed a bit <laughs> since. Uh, <laughs> you're still beautiful, baby. I guess somebody after first service went to the bookstore and told Cindy the only thing about us that has changed is the color of our hair. Is the man blind? <laughs> and then way back then, 9,000 sermons ago, um, man, God was faithful. God is faithful. Father, thank you for your faithfulness to your word with the gospel, your son, the Holy Spirit. You are faithful. Your word is true. All the things we've gone through for 36 years, highs and lows, you're faithful. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you love us. 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 Thank you for the cross that proves it. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you know how to invade our lives with faith, to believe the unbelievable, that God would die in my place, our place, that we can have his righteousness in our account, all by faith, a gift that all we do is receive it. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for each of the 66 books that point to that. Thank you for the privilege it's been to preach all of it and to be in the Gospel of John again today. I thank you. The privilege we have in this city, in this building, upstairs, overflow, to open your word. We do ask for the fresh, fresh presence of Jesus that you would come, Lord. We want you to come here today and to talk with us. Where we need encouragement or where we need correction for you to do that. And if there's anybody that's lost, Lord, in this building, youth, children, upstairs, this room, on radio, on the internet, across around the world, I pray that, Lord Jesus, you would call them by name, that they'd hear your voice, that they would follow you, trust you, believe in you. We ask that you would receive all the honor and glory, Jesus, for this service. You're the only one who's worthy, and we celebrate you today. It's in your name we'd ask. Amen. You guys want to thank my wife for all the stuff she's done forever. We are in the Gospel of John, chapter 6. Last week, we finished the story of the feeding of the 5,000, really 15 to 20,000. It was 5,000 men. And we shared with you, you know, that's like the biggest story in the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, it's in all four Gospels. And uh, the only thing bigger in the Bible, miracle-wise, would be the resurrection in all four Gospels. So it's a big-time, big-time thing. And uh, I know that after we started our church, that was pretty big-time for me, and uh, we gave it to the Lord, and we grabbed our Bibles, book of Hebrew, all of that, and then we, we were off and running. And uh, you need to know that everything we wanted to have happen, happened. And so every prayer that we prayed was answered, yes. We found lottery tickets in our mailbox. People started sending us money. Uh, nobody got divorced. Nobody died. I've had perfect health, wealth, and prosperity ever since. So you need to follow me and believe a lie. That's not the truth at all. Matter of fact, what we would call the American gospel, the prosperity gospel, is a lie. And that's the truth. You say, how do you know it? Well, because I'm 65 years old. I pastor the greatest church I've ever seen. And boy, do we have a boatload of problems. And boy, do we have a boatload of storms. 
And about the time you get through one storm, then another storm comes along. You think, well, we must be doing something wrong, or maybe we're doing things right. And once in a while, God corrects us with a storm. I don't know about you, but I would bet there's storms in your life. And you say, no, there's no storms in my life, liar. All I have to do is say COVID. Ah. All I have to do is say election. Ah. All I have to do is say economy. Ah. See? Storms. Well, that's not the ones that got my attention. Well, I know that because we have people here and there and out there. That doesn't mean anything to you because of the storms in your marriage. The storms with your kids, your children. You say, no, my marriage is great. It's when I go to work on Monday. Yeah, I know, I know. I get that too. The storm at school. Or maybe it's the neighborhood and the guy lives right next door and I just want to take care of that guy. You got a storm. Well, here's good news. <laughs> I know the one who is the Lord of storms. Any storm. He's Lord. And if he's the Lord of storms, then we just need Jesus to come to the rescue, right? Now, he'll do that in his own time, but I mean, he's a superhero. I'm going to prove to you this morning from the Bible, he's a superhero. And whatever your problem might be, uh, by the way, I still believe in miracles. I believe in miracles. I believe God can change people on the spot when it's all in his sovereignty, all according to his time frame. And you say, well, how do you know that? Because he saved me on the spot. Bang. And I'm not the same. I am not. You say, well, I don't know if I like you. Well, you should have seen what I used to be. You would really not like me. So uh, you say, where you? it's all right here where we left off last week. I'm not looking for a sermon to celebrate our birthday or anniversary. No, nope. it's right here. And if I started by saying, okay, let's, let's, all the different storms I see in a very short paragraph, all the different storms. But if I said the storm of misunderstanding, the storm of of misunderstandings. You say, where'd you get that? Well, I looked right where we were, back up to verse 14 of chapter 6. He just got through with the miracle of the breaking of the five loaves, the two fish, fed 15 to 20,000 people. Verse 14, then those men, 5,000 men, when they had seen the sign, the breaking, the multiplying of the fish and the loaves, when they had seen the sign, they ate of the sign. They were full because of the sign that Jesus did. They, they said, this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. They're agreeing with Deuteronomy 18.15, Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, when Moses said there's a, a prophet coming. And then they knew those verses, and when they got all the food, and so they agree. They actually, the, you're, the, you're the prophet that was predicted. That's true. That's true. That's true. That's not a misunderstanding. That's true. But what are you going to do with that? Therefore, the therefore ties in the walking on the water, the storm on the sea, is all part of the same story with the feeding of the 5,000. How do you know that? Therefore, they think he's the prophet. He is the prophet. You're right on that. Therefore, when Jesus perceived, whoa, 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 whoa. The word perceived is gnosko. It means to know, to know exactly, to know intimately. He knows. Well, how does he know? Uh -huh. My hero is telepathic. He knows what everybody's thinking, all at the same time. And he said, no, he doesn't. Yes, he does. How does he? He's God. He's a hero. And he knows what they were thinking. He knows what you're thinking. Can I hear it? Amen? You say, well, I'm having negative thoughts. Stop it. Stop. Stop. Because he knows. Therefore, when Jesus perceived, when he knew what they were about to come, what, that what they were about to come, and take him by force to make him king. Let me read that again. Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king. Now, wait, 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 wait. Okay, you got the prophet right, but you got the king wrong. You got the king wrong. They want to take him by force to make him king. So let's stop for a second and say, why would they want to do that? Well, they want to do that because Rome is in charge, and they're tired of Rome. They're being occupied by Rome. They're not Romans. They're Jews. And now we got a king. Let's make him king. Well, Caesar. They don't like Caesar at all. We'll make Jesus our king. Yeah, but you're wrong. Ah, taxes. They paid all their taxes to Rome. They, they want a king. 
They want a king. Well, the problem with this is Jesus is king, but this is not his kingdom yet. You say, why isn't his kingdom? Just bring your kingdom. Solve our political problems, our economic problems, our social problems. Jesus, we want you to be king. And he knew that's what they were thinking. By the way, I think the disciples were in on that because they want him to be king too. Matter of fact, I can see Peter going like, man, if he's king, I can be prime minister. Da-da-da. Judas, he wants him to be king because he's the treasurer. Whoa, can you imagine that amount of sum? But Jesus perceived, and by the way, you're wrong wanting him to be king. Because it's not prophet king, it's prophet priest and king. You see, where you got it wrong, where you have a misunderstanding, is I am the prophet but I'm a priest that's going to have to sacrifice myself so that you can be in my kingdom that hasn't come yet. So the misunderstanding, you're you're kind of ahead of this thing. You already want it to be kingdom, but it's not kingdom now. It has to be kingdom here. And for that to happen, I'm going to have to die. I know the disciples don't get that yet. They never do get it till resurrection. So he's got that. Hey, I just fed you all this stuff. I'm glad you have a full belly and that you want me to be your king, but I'm not that kind of king yet. So what we need to do, Jesus is going to have to argue with them. He's going to have to teach them. We all have to go to seminary together. Or he just diffuses it and walks away. You see, part of the way Jesus will solve this problem, the storm of misunderstanding, he will not address it. He will not argue with it. He's not going to debate it. He's just going to, like you do with your kids, you know, go to your room. Go to your room. Why did you do that? Because we need some time to inform some people what's really going on. I told you last week, they got the free bread. But on that illustration, Jesus will spend 49 verses explaining to them. It's the next part of the Gospel of John. Don't read it now, but this afternoon, knock yourself out about the bread from heaven. So he will explain what he's doing, but not right then. And to his disciples, he will fill them in, but not right then. You see, the way he calms this storm, the storm of misunderstanding, he's going to give it time. He's going to give it time. So look at what the verse says. Therefore, when Jesus perceived, telepathic, that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed. He actually sends the disciples away. He's going to dismiss the crowd He departed again to the mountain by himself alone. He's going to commune with his father. Well, Jesus, just fix it. I am. Give it time. Have you learned that yet with your problem of misunderstanding? That sometimes we rush to solve the problem, explain what we really meant? Did you know, I never find Jesus running after anybody saying, you misunderstood, let me explain. He never did that. He didn't. Oh, he would follow up. He was always teaching, but at the right time. Can I hear an amen? Uh, We've seen all kinds of storms come into our church of misunderstanding. You say, how often does that happen? Every time I preach. (laughs) And then... Somebody will get up and walk out. So what do you do? I run after them, say, no, you misunderstood. Let me explain. Or can I trust God in his sovereignty? By the way, my door is always open. Always. But I never find Jesus trying to, if I say, defend himself, clarify himself. Just give it time. There is a right time. Can I hear an amen? It's amazing to me when he does explain to all these same ones that got the free food. And we'll see that next week if he tarries by next week, and I am not dead by next week, but we'll see it. He explains for 49 verses. But he's got another problem. The disciples, well, they're already following him, right? Well, it depends how you want to say that. Because you've got another storm. It's called the storm of hard-heartedness. The storm of hardened 
hearts. Interesting. We read verse 16. Now, when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into the boat, went over the sea to Capernaum. It was already dark, and Jesus had not come to them. Now, why did Jesus send them away? What's happened with their hearts? Can I see Mark chapter 6, verse 45? In Mark, it tells us immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and to go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he sent the multitude away. So they came over together. It was his idea to come over together, remember? And, uh, but after the feeding of the 5,000, after they cleaned up the mess, he says, now get out of here. I, I need you guys to leave. He made them leave. And then he went and had the multitude. He dismissed the multitude. And then he went up to the mountain to pray. And you say, well, why did that happen? Well, because I read ahead. And can I see the next verse? Mark chapter 6, verse 52. At the end of the storm, for they had not understood about the loaves. They had not understood. They didn't get it about the loaves. Because their heart was hardened. You got the biggest miracle in all four Gospels, and they didn't get it. They didn't understand it. What's wrong with you guys? But Jesus, the Word of God tells us, their heart was hard. Their heart was hard. Well, where did that come from? Well, if you remember back to the beginning, they had been on a mission trip, and they came back from their mission trip. They're tired. They're wore out. Lots of things happened on their first mission trip. Two by two, they went out, and they came back. They wanted to report to Jesus everything they saw. Remember that when they got back from that mission trip, all wore out, that John the Baptist was beheaded. Now, that shouldn't happen according to their blueprint, but in God's sovereignty, it was exactly on time. And they're confused by that. They're, they're in grief by that. Their second biggest hero after Jesus was John the Baptist. Some of them, that was their rabbi. He's dead. At the same time, there's so many people coming around Jesus, they don't have time to eat. They don't have time to eat. The text tells us that. They're wore out. People everywhere. John the Baptist is gone. Hey, what's going on? And then Jesus says, hey, I know what we need to do. How about we get in a boat, we go on vacation. Remember? Let's get away by ourselves to a deserted place. We'll go, and I can see the disciples in the boat waving goodbye to everybody, thinking, you know, I'm glad that's over. And then we're going to go with Jesus on vacation. Remember the crowd they left that was wearing them out? Ran around the Sea of Galilee, and then when they pull up on the shore on the other side, it's only eight, nine miles, but when they got, there's all the people they left. You know what they thought? Don't answer the phone. <laughs> Go somewhere else. We get a break with you, right? See, they saw people as a problem. Where Jesus had compassion and saw people as an opportunity. Now, before I go any further, can I tell you, serving Jesus is hard. Serving Jesus is hard. It'll wear you out. It'll chew you up. And you say, well, every day is fun. Most days are not fun. Why? Because people... And they run around all different places, and they want all kinds of things, and it, nev it never, ever stops. Then people die. Your hero dies. And then you don't have time to eat. I'm not trying to complain. I just understand why they, I, they got hardened hearts. So what does Jesus do? Because remember, the disciples come and say, get rid of these people. Send them away. Don't ever tell, don't ever tell Jesus to send people away. Don't do that. You know why? Because he loves people. That's why we have a problem. I don't know if I told you my problem, but we got people out there. Overflow, 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 overflow. Hey, Pastor Bill, what will you do next? Well, I'm hoping we go from red to orange someday. But if we don't, we'll go to three services. Don't tell my staff because they're not going to like that. They're not. We can't do three services. We will not turn people away. We will not turn people away. And trust me, I don't want to do three services. So we just needed to go. And I'm encouraged with what's going on in our city, but we'll take it as it's come. Why do they have hard hearts? They want to send the people away. And Jesus said, well, you feed them. Do we have enough? And then remember, it's like, hey, Lord, if we do Wendy's four by four, it's going to take $80,000. There's a lot of people here. He said, well, see what you got. So they go and they come back and say, yeah, we got one little kid. His mom packed him two fish, sardines, and five biscuits. That's all we got. That's all I need. 
Remember who had to get the people in order and sit, sit them down? 50 and 100 disciples. Remember who served 1,000 people apiece at least? It was the disciples. Remember that Jesus said, now go get the fragments? It was the disciples. Now, if you're a disciple, they should be worshiping God. Look what he did with five biscuits and two fish. Ah, Jesus is amazing. But they're just like you and me. They're just like you and me. When is this ever going to stop? And they misunderstood the loaves. And their heart got hard. So what did Jesus do? Um, you guys need to go. Really? Uh-huh. You need to go. I'll dismiss. dismiss. Aren't you going to go with us? No. Nope. They got in the boat. It's dark. And they left without Jesus. The storm of hardened hearts. By the way, I don't know what's going on in your life right now. You might find yourself. You know, is your heart soft? Is it teachable? Are you where you should be with the Lord? Or is this bugging you and this is bugging you and this is bugging me? How are you doing? Whoa, 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 whoa. Listen, if your heart is hard, do it the easy way. Just do it the easy way. Lord, my heart's getting hard. Help me, Lord. I confess, I repent. You say, Pastor Bill, how often does that happen? It's happened three times today. I'm not joking. I'm not joking. Three times today. Now, to the best of my knowledge, nobody here has ticked me off yet, so don't do it. <laughs> you say, what? I just, not, not that anybody in first service ticked me off. Don't, don't misunderstand. But there was three things today that I'm thinking, no, no, no. Uh, that's not the way I planned it. It's when that's happening. That's when you want to say, Lord, I, I want to understand. I want to know you. And I don't want this heart to be hard. We talked about that Wednesday night. More than, see, because all God wants is your heart. Yeah, that's all he wants. And you say, well, when did you? And when I was 16, I gave him my heart. But he still wants it today. It's crazy. And then all of a sudden, you get hard. You get people. You get things. Not fair, not fair, not fair. My hero's gone. What am I going to do? And then you don't even know your heart's getting hard. Before, you're in ministry, and you've, you've lost the joy. You're in Grace Church, and you're just going through the motions. Or we just showed up and you're thinking, will you ever get done? No, I'm not going to get done today. I'm sorry. It's my birthday, so get over it. He just wants your heart. And the disciples from mission trips through grief in ministry with Jesus, a bazillion people fed seconds and thirds and leftovers, and they missed it. They missed it. Welcome to the storm of correction. Nobody said amen. Translated, you could call it time to go to the woodshed. What? Oh, yeah, we're going to talk about the storm in the sea where Jesus comes walking on the water. By the way, there's all kinds of storms from the world, the flesh, and the devil. That could all happen. I get that. But did you know some storms are because your heart's hard, you're not getting it. So in God's grace, by the way, he's never mad. He's not trying to condemn. He's trying to correct out of love. You'll be very confused for a while, but when you get to the end of the story, you realize, oh, Jesus is trying to reassure me and comfort me. Yes, yes, yes. But it can be a scary ride, this storm of correction, because Jesus said, okay, you guys get out of here. I'll set the multitude free. I'm going to go up with my Father and pray. And it was dark. And Jesus is not in their boat. They're experienced fishermen. It's only eight, nine miles to get back to where they started on the other side of the lake. So off they go. They start rowing. You know the story. Twelve guys in, the, in a boat at night without Jesus. Storm of correction. The storm of correction. Verse 18. Verse 16, excuse me. Now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. They got into the boat, went over the sea toward Capernaum. It was already dark, and Jesus had not come to them. Then the sea arose. The sea arose because a great wind was blowing. So when they had rowed about three or four miles, uh, what you don't know, just right there from John, that took them six to eight hours. They're only halfway. The sea is really bad. 
and they're on a storm. They don't know it's correction. It was fine when they left, but then all of a sudden, by the way, the way, the Sea of Galilee, I've been there eight times. I've been out on the sea. What I love about the Sea of Galilee, it's the same as it was when Jesus was there. I mean, it's the same bowl. It's the same water. It's the same topography around it. But what can happen really, really quick, because it's below sea level, that the wind can come from the west toward the east and can make a storm like that quick. And so there they are, and the storm comes up that quick. They are on the storm of correction. They're in the middle of a mess. One thing I love about the story, Jesus is up praying. Can I see Mark chapter 6 and verse 48? While they're out there in the storm, then he saw them straining at the at rowing. He saw them straining at rowing. He saw them for hours straining at rowing in the storm, in the wind, in the dark. For the wind was against them. You ever feel like the wind's against you? And what do I like about that? He saw them. You see, my hero is telepathic, but he's also telescopic. He's four miles away. You say, well, a telescope won't do you any good at four o'clock in the morning. I know. That's why he's got night vision. He's got night vision, huh? Well, yeah, and not only that, he's got x-ray vision. He can see right through stuff. He can. What are you saying? Whatever storm you might be in, whether it's your own creating or God discipline or it's just a storm, aren't you glad that God sees us in the middle of our frustration, in the middle of the storm? He sees and he cares. He cares. He's not mad. We don't come under condemnation, but we do have correction. We do have conviction. And they're not getting the love thing. You're not getting really who I am. You're jumping ahead to king when we have to do the priest thing first. So in the storm with all that stuff, he sees them. Can I see the quote by Barclay? On the hillside, Jesus had prayed, communed with God. And down on the lake, he could see the boat with the rowers toiling at the oars. He had not forgotten. He was not too busy with God to think of them. Isn't that amazing? I mean, when you really calculate that, like, you really see me, Lord? Uh-huh. You really care? Uh-huh. You got your eye? I, I got it. I got it, Bill. Can I go to sleep now? You can go to sleep. You going to watch it? Yeah, I'll watch you. I'll watch you. You understand my kids, right? I got them, I got them, I got them. You understand the storm? I got them. You know the crazy one at church? Yeah, I got, I got her too. Him, her, him, them. Got them, got them, got them. And you know about, yeah, I got it. Go over it. I got it. Really? Uh-huh. You see it? You see me? I got you, Bill. I got you. I got you. You know how tired I am? I got it. I know. You see my heart? Oh, I see your heart, Bill. I need to do some work there. Really? You see it? Uh-huh. Is it going to be easy? He goes, no. Uh-huh. Matter of fact, it's going to get spooky. No, I'm going to scare you a little. No, no. See, Jesus sees, but Jesus spooks. Nobody said amen on that. Nobody. Not even theologians in the room. Not even a pastor. Nobody wants this amen, Jesus spooks. He does. Well, you sound like they're going to get scared. They're not going to get scared. They're going to get scared to death. Like their worst nightmare ever in their lives. You say, no. I say, oh, yeah, I read ahead. You see this storm of correction? Jesus sees, but he knows how to scare you. Not to scare you to death, but to wake you up. He actually is going to spook you, scare you, so that you know who he is. And you say, you better prove this. Well, I'm glad you asked. Let me Go right to it. Jesus spooks, verse 19. So when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus. They saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat. He's walking on water. Well, he's telepathic, telescopic. He's anti-gravity. Does he have a hoverboard? He don't need no hoverboard. He's just walking on water. Well, who else walked on water? Nobody. You got one axe head floating in the Old Testament. That's all you got. Who walked on water? Jesus. That's kind of scary. 
well, it's kind of scary. If it's 4 o'clock in the morning, everybody's wet. He's wet. You can't see. And they look out and they, he's walking on the water. Except they don't know it's he. They don't know it's him. They don't know it's Jesus. Picture, you know, six, eight hours. They're tired. They're wore out. They're mad. Things are not going their way. They can't get to the other side. They're frustrated. And then somebody looks up. Can I see the verse out of Mark chapter 6? Mark chapter 6. Now about the fourth watch. It's 3 to 6 o'clock in the morning. 3 to 6 in the morning. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he, Jesus, came to them walking on the sea. That's not natural. And would have passed them by. Would have passed them by. Don't miss that. Would have passed them by. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. Would have passed them by. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost. And they cried out. For they all saw him were troubled, both in Mark and Matthew. They're seeing ghosts. Well, they're brave fishermen. We do this for a living. <laughs> There's a ghost walking on the water, and he's passing us up. Yeah, but he's a friendly ghost. Some of you really old people know, you know, Casper was a friendly ghost. Boo. You say, Jesus would never do that. Jesus already has done that. There's times he's spooky. Why? To get their heart. You see, with some stubborn redneck fishermen, you got to scare them a little bit. I, I, I'd like to have a video with these guys half drowning, mad, hard-hearted, and I don't know which one of the 12 first spotted him. <laughs> like, and I'm sure he's wiping his eyes and looking, and, and he's getting closer, and he's, ah, ah, ah. And then the other one's looking and going, ah, you know, and then, and then I don't think Jesus was glowing. I don't know, somehow, but they, they could see him. I, I don't, but, and then, you know, he's not sinking, and he, I don't think he's, well, maybe, here he comes walking on the water, and they, they think it's a ghost. Isn't the Lord strange how he does stories? I mean, he could have lots of different things. You know, he could have been like, you know, the laser eye thing. He could have, he could have gone up and lightning bolts coming out of his fingers. He could have, but he just wanted to let them think it was a ghost walking on the water. Walking on the water. Huh. He doesn't let them stay scared for long. I mean, he's got their attention. Do you agree with me? He has their attention. What's the problem? It's their heart. They missed the whole love thing. You missed it. You, you missed it. You're going through the motion. I need your heart. And then all of a sudden, they have to go through this extra stuff. By the way, I'm trying to learn. I don't want to go through the extra stuff. I don't. So the moment I start thinking my heart's getting hard, it's just better, the, the easy, it just repent on the, just repent. Okay, God, you got me again. I'm a stupid man. I repent. I just don't want to be Spooky Jesus. I, I, I don't want that if I can avoid it. Because with all the other storms I can't avoid, that's one I can. So, Lord, I just, I repent. I repent. I repent. I repent. I've had to do that three times today. Why? Because my heart was getting hard. And I don't want to be spooked by Jesus. But what's he going to do when he gets there? He's actually going to smile and speak to them. You mean in that ghost-like state, and he's walking on water. I'm not saying he looked like it. That's what they thought he was. He was ghost. He's going to actually smile and speak to them. Which they're not, he's not going to beat them. He's not going to condemn them. He came to correct them. Verse 20, Jesus smiles and speaks. So when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw they were afraid, but he said to them, it is I. Do not be afraid. He didn't say boo. They're freaking out. And he said, it is I. It's interesting in the Greek that that's almost like I am. Now, that's going to be very specific in the Greek, but it's already given us hints toward that ahead of time. I am. It is I. It is I. Do not be afraid. All three Gospels, because it's in Matthew, Mark, and John. This story is not in Luke. But all three Gospels, be not afraid, be not afraid, be not afraid. Oh, but can I see in Mark's Gospel, Mark's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 50, but immediately he talked with them and said to them, be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. Be of good cheer. Can I hear you say, be of good cheer? 
Some of you didn't say it, and some of you didn't say it right. Did you know if you're like a ghost trying to scare people, you can't say be of good cheer with the right inflection, like be of good cheer. See, that, it just doesn't work. It, it doesn't work. To say be of good cheer. For my Jesus to say be, he's all wet, and he's walking on water, and they're all wet. I, I get that, I get that. But when he said be, you got to know he was smiling, like gotcha, <laughs> boo, no, be of good cheer. Hey, it's me, don't be afraid. Can, can you feel that? You're going through the death kind of storm. You think it's over. It's not over. Nobody's going to the bottom of the sea. Nobody's going to drown. This whole thing's a setup for 12 guys in the boat. We're seeing ghosts. Hey, big and tear, it's me. It's me. Can you see Jesus doing it like that? That's my Savior. That's the one who rescues me. That's the one when I can't even breathe. He comes and says, it's me. Be of good cheer. You? Uh-huh. This was a setup? Uh-huh. The wind and the waves? Are, uh-huh. But it's really you? Uh-huh. Be not afraid. Well, I want this storm to go away. Sometimes, sometimes not. Be of good cheer. It's me. I got you. I see you. I came here for you. What do you want? Your heart. You're getting burned out on ministry. You're getting burned out on church. You're getting burned out on COVID. You're getting burned out on marriage. You're getting burned out. I did a miracle for you last week. You should have been jumping up and down, and you didn't even thank me for it. Asked you to serve people you never were grateful. What, you think that's your right? Get out of here. I need to teach you a lesson. And then you get so desperate, and he says, hey, be a good cheer." It's me. It's my heart. It's what we preached on Wednesday out of the book of Numbers. All God wants is their heart. Hebrews chapter 3, all he wants is your heart. I gave him my heart 49 years ago. It's amazing. He still wants it today. We get burned out on this story or that story or this circumstance or that, this king, that king. Ooh. You win, Lord. You win. You win. You win. Interesting in your Bibles. Because he's going to save them from the storm that is really a storm of correction. Verse 21, Jesus saves. But he said to them, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. Then they willingly received him into the boat. All 12 disciples agreed together. <laughs> we need him in our boat. And they willingly received him. I, I, got, I got to see that word. I got to see that word. That word's there for a reason. Because they could have said, well, let's take a vote about it, you know. Six say yes, six say no. They didn't do that. They wanted Jesus in their boat. They wanted him in the boat. But watch this. He's not a boat crasher. He could be. He did, he's not a boat assumer like no, they willingly received him into the boat. The last time we saw that word in the book of John was chapter 5, verse 40. When Jesus, out of his mouth, said, you are not willing to come to me, talking to the enforcers. It's interesting about Jesus. He doesn't force himself into the boat or your boat or circumstances. He asks. He knocks. And for the ones that get it, they hear the voice willingly, I want you to be my Savior. Willingly, I want you in my boat. Willingly, Lord, I want you today. Be of good cheer. Don't be afraid. I've come to save you, not just from hell, but from Monday. Aren't you glad Jesus came to save us from Monday? That's tomorrow, by the way, if you're doing the math. That's tomorrow. Does that mean all your problems are going to go away? No. 
No, they're not. Same crowd, same problem. We'll pick up on that next week. We got a lot of talking to do with them. And by the way, almost all of them will reject the Lord. All they want is free food. The multitude, that's all they want. Jesus knows that. They're going to leave him. But to these 12 guys, willingly received him in the boat. Can I see the way that looked? Mark chapter 6. Then he went up into the boat to them. The wind ceased. And they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled. Look at the way the Holy Spirit recorded that. That's unbelievable. What happened to hard hearts? They were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure. And they marveled. I, I should have done this. I forgot about it. Do you guys have that emoji? I got an emoji where um, it's a guy with glasses and mustache, and, but then his head goes kaboom. You know the one I'm talking about? Boom! Like, yeah, boom! That's that verse. Well, that's what should have happened. That's what should have happened at the feeding of the 5,000. I mean, we got 15,000 people fed by this kid's sack lunch. They should, they were, they, boom, should have happened then. But it didn't. Why? Because their heart was hard. So what's God going to do? Just kick them off the team? No. He said, take a boat ride. We'll get it straightened out. And after the scary loop-de-loop on the Sea of Galilee, it's me. Do you believe me now? And when it went, boom, like that, they just went. Can I see out of Matthew? Same story. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him. Truly you are the Son of God. They worshipped him. The hardened heart is now one of worship. That should have happened at the breaking of the loaves, but it didn't. Isn't that great that when we don't get it the first time, God has a couple other chapters to tell us. And then finally, you know, even somebody brain dead like me would go, okay, you win, you win, you win. You win. How do you know when you're free? When you worship. You are the son of God, not just when I got saved, you're the son of God now. Like when I'm alone, when I'm just trying to, if I say, find the sermon, where's the sermon? Here's a sermon, there's a sermon, everywhere there's a sermon, sermon. Where's the Lord? What do you want me to say? And then all of a sudden, when God is so good and lays it out, and time just stops. Hours go by. And then God said, this happened to me last night. He said, you said, Bill, Think of it like this. And I can't explain what it's like when all of a sudden I get it. And I know when I get it because worship happens. Cindy wasn't there. Landry wasn't singing in the corner. I didn't have, you know, Hillsong on my Apple phone or anything. Nothing. It's just me and God in worship. I had to get on my knees. I had to cry. It was so good. So good. So good. You got me again, God. He says, all I want is your heart. Pastor Doug Jr. had a, a great article on our newsletter this week, and he talked about how practically for him, and he got it from John Corson, but if you can, like, have a chair for Jesus, wherever you have your devotions, whatever you do, but you have a chair for Jesus. So, like, in my office here, I have one of the old pink chairs from the Y. It's, it's my chair for Jesus. And you say, well, why do you do that? Well, it just helps me. It helps me. And where I have my Bible reading in my home, I have my recliner, and, but then I try to see th there's a couch, and, okay, Jesus, you're right there. It helps me. Up in my office, in what I call a library now, there's a, a black chair I got from my grandmother, and that's, that's chairs for Jesus. Hey, Lord, are you here? Are you here? Oh, he is here. And by the way, he doesn't need the chair, does he? I need the reminder. You say, well, where is he when you drive your car? Well, he's right over there. Put on your seatbelt because I'm not a good driver, Lord. And uh, he, he even helps me there. He just helps me there. So I don't know where you're at. Maybe you all do that all the time. Maybe you, you worship the Lord like that. Maybe you know your heart's in great, but you'll know your heart is fine if you're worshiping like those disciples where they finally get it. Truly you are the Son of God. 
Can you see the freshness of that, the beauty of that? They missed the <laughs> big production, but boy, they got it after the storm of correction. And Jesus always has a surprise for us. I, I love that he's a, a God of surprises. And so this storm of correction, like, okay, okay, now they're all worshiping. But remember, they're only halfway across the lake. Remember, that storm is, remember, they spent six, eight hours. They're all used up. So Jesus, kind of like a bonus, like, okay, okay. Because we know he's telepathic. We know he's telescopic. Did you know he's teleport? No, what do you mean teleport? Well, let's just end the story real quick for these guys. It is I, do not be afraid. Then they willingly received him into the boat. Immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. What does that mean? <laughs> Problem solved. You guys thought you still had four miles to go. Uh -uh, boom, we're there, we're there. Well, you know, God, can, God can do whatever he wants. Boat, 12 guys, him, bang. How'd you do that? Because I'm a superhero. I know your thoughts. I see you all the time. I can walk on water, and I can transport like that. You say, really? Uh-huh. Does that happen in the New Testament? Uh-huh. Remember Philip? And all of a sudden, bang. He's out of there, transported by the Holy Spirit. Will it happen again? Bang. Beam me up, Scotty. Only it ain't Star Trek. It's God. And all it needs is to shout the voice of the archangel, I'm out of here, the trumpet of God. Boom, meeting in the air. How can you prove that? He does it right there. What's that? Bonus. You guys worked hard enough. Your hearts are right. Let's just get to the other side. Boom. Oh, you're the God of time and space. Uh, that's nothing for me. I created time and space. Do you know what I'm thinking right now? I know exactly what you're thinking right now. Do you know where I'm going? I know where you're going before you get there. What do you want? Your heart. Storms of correction, storms of misunderstanding, storms of hard hearts. Oh, by the way, there's also a storm of opportunity. If I said the storm of opportunity, and you say, no, wait, you preached through the whole paragraph. I know I did, but there's an opportunity here that you can only see in Matthew chapter 14. Can I see Matthew real quick? The storm of opportunity. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. So the storm's still going. They think it's a ghost. She said, hey, be of good cheer. It's me. Don't be afraid. Peter, if it's you, Lord, command me to come to you on the water. And so he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. By the way, one guy's a winner in the story, 11 are losers, Who's the losers? The 11 that stayed in the boat. You want to walk on water, you got to get out of the boat. Well, what assurance do I have? You don't have any assurance. You see Jesus, and he says, come. Hey, Lord, if it's you, can I? Yeah. Let's. In the Bible, there's only two water walkers in the whole Bible, Jesus and Peter. And you say, but he's a failure. He's not a failure. He believed what nobody else could believe. He believed what nobody else could see. And he actually listened to the Lord. Now, you got his eyes off the Lord. I get that. And so, but when he, was, when he saw the wind, it was boisterous. He was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. By the way, the quickest prayer in the Bible right there. And you say, how do you know? Go to the pool, jump off the diving board, go in feet first, and the moment your feet hit the water, you're going to start sinking, like right away. How long do you have to say, Lord, save me? About that long. Lord, save me. And right away, Jesus reached out his hand and saved Peter. Can I hear an amen? Peter, walking on water, Lord, save me. And immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand, caught him, and said to him, oh, you have little faith. Why do you doubt? But I don't think he said, oh, you're a little bait. <laughs> Squeeze her. I don't think he said it like that at all. I don't think, I, I just don't. Be of good cheer. Hey, Lord, if it's really you, can I, come on out, Pete. Come on, come on. And can you see? This could be life or death. The disciples said, did you pray about this? Did you pass about that? No, 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 it's Jesus. I'm gonna, if you're wrong, you're going to die. I'm, I'm, hey, hey, told you. <laughs> I'm walking on water. I'm walking on water. See, storms create tremendous opportunities to be a water walker. Nobody's going to believe you. You might sink, but he's not going to let you drown. You know, sometimes we play it too safe. There's a risk with everything we do. But then there's times that God might give you an opportunity in the middle of a storm, in the middle of grief, in the middle of, what, COVID? To walk on water. Yeah, but Lord, I'm only 29. 
My wife's about to have a, bi- a baby. What do you want me to do? Go to a lock shop and start a church. Did you know every pastor I knew told me not to do it? Because they told me it'll never work. Did you know they're right? I don't know. I've watched 100, 200 churches try to start since then. It won't work unless God's in it. And I can't prove that to anybody else. I don't need to. I know what God told me to do. And one of those pastors was absolutely like, you know, my David kind of guy. And don't tell God. I remember when I had to go see a banker the first time to try to buy a building. Their church was seven years old. God blessed it and blessed it and blessed it. But then I had to go downtown, banker in the office kind of thing. And I thought, we just need a little money to buy a church. I hate going to banks, trying to get a loan. I hate it. It goes against everything in me. And I sat there behind this guy's desk, and he pulled the banker thing. He said, well, how many people are in your church? And, uh, and what was your offering last week? Da, da, da. And he did the math. He says, that's how much your people give per person. It's like 18 bucks. But what are you saying? What? <laughs> You're a loser. <laughs> Your church is a loser. <laughs> You're not going to get the loan. And I remember how I felt. And God said, no, I got another plan. He ended up giving us that building, basically. We turned the building. And we were able to buy the building because we self-purchased it. Long story. But God said, no, let me show you how to walk on water. The dirt story, I don't have time for all these stories. The dirt story, uh, Roger, you were here when the dirt story happened. Even Roger didn't believe. There's Scott over there. Scott didn't believe the, the dirt story. My, my men of God didn't believe because I'd asked for the mountain. The seed of, uh, seed of a mustard seed can move a mountain. I have seen that with these eyes. But even the guy that heard the sermon and the sermon didn't believe it. So I finally said, get down here. They're moving a mountain. And they came down. They looked. I mean, the dirt story is amazing, amazing. That doesn't make me, I'm, I'm not great. I just know sometimes God has you do things. You've got to get out of the boat. Is it sink or swim? Well, if Jesus told you to get out of the boat, he's not going to let you sink. You might go down to here, but, you know, it's far. So when does that stop? It never stops. You got kids? You have jobs? You say, I've never witnessed anybody. Get out of the boat. It's COVID. Get out of the boat. Wear a mask and tell them about Jesus. When is that? This building? I could go on forever. This building took me three years where I thought I was dying. I thought I was dying, but I knew what God told me. But it got so bad that only Cindy believed in it. Radio? Oh, man. Radio's not even done. Radio is off the chart. Why are you telling us this? If you want to walk on water, you got to get out of the boat. And there's times where you do the math. You think, if this doesn't work, you say, What's next? I don't know. I'm just trying to get through COVID with you guys. Are we going to walk on water? We already are, so to speak. Will there be a bigger story? Uh Uh-huh. What is it? I don't know yet. Will it be scary? Uh Uh-huh. Like a roller coaster, you know? You don't want to ride that thing until it goes over the top. And Some old people give up on roller coasters. Cindy and I never have blew our grandkids away. We rode everything they'd ride. Afterwards, we were sorry, but we're not going to let you guys. <laughs> Storms. All kinds of them, all kinds of reasons. But we know the Lord of all the storms. And Jesus wants to rescue your heart. That's it. What happens after that? <laughs> Teleport. We're out of here at any point in time. Father, thank you for your word today. And my friends here, they wouldn't know some of the stuff in my, my life even physically right now. They wouldn't know. I don't expect them to, but you do. They wouldn't know some stuff with my kids like I don't know with theirs. They don't know what storms. I don't know theirs. 
But I do know the Lord of the storms. And that you've rescued me three times already today. And I want to praise you for that. You've rescued me, Lord, for 36 years when I'd sit there with the Bible. Begging you to help me see. You rescued me every time. And through church, it gets really complicated in a world full of stuff. But you've rescued us, Lord, over and over and over again. And for my friends here, Lord, just the fact they're here, you're still rescuing us, Lord. But I know some have things with a marriage or children or work or health or just life. In that sense, Lord, I just want to give you my heart again. I don't want to go into that woodshed of correction unnecessarily. So I just give you my heart. It's not much. It's all I got. I, I love that verse where God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son. That whoever wants to just believe in him should not perish. What he did on the cross, what he accomplished with his death, burial, resurrection, what the gospel's all about, what Jesus did, won't perish but have everlasting life. He, he rescues us when we're willing. So out there on the internet, maybe upstairs on the mezzanine or the overflow or in this room, I, you might be here today. You've never let Jesus in your boat, ever. He's a polite Savior. He's knocked on the door of your heart. But you've never said yes. Somehow you're afraid that he's going to take over. Oh, he is going to take over, but all he wants is your heart. He'll give you a new heart first. He calls you by name, but you do have to respond. You do have to be willing. Then you might be here today, and it's like you didn't know the storm would get so personal, be so powerful. It's like not just having a normal Sunday. You're at that point where you can't breathe. You don't know if, it's gonna, if you're going to make it. You know Jesus, but the storm is so enormous. It's like all you're seeing is a ghost. He wants your heart too. And there's something about those disciples in that boat when they're in worship that truly you are the Son of God. Not just the first time we say it, but years and years later that we keep saying it so. I don't know your lives. I don't know what's going on, but I am going to give an opportunity if you're here today and you need Jesus as your Savior. Let him in your boat, your life. Say yes to him. Or you might be going through that school, that storm of correction, and you need to get Jesus back where he needs to be, that heart-to-heart -heart connection with you. You just need prayer for the storm. So in either case, salvation or through the storm. If I'd just like to pray for you. So if you're here this morning in this room or out there, you can stand as well. I'm just going to ask you to stand. If it's salvation that you need or I'm going through a storm, Lord, my heart's not right. I, I want my heart to be right. Thank you, sister. Thank you back there, my brother. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you guys back there. Thank you, brother. Thank you, guys. Lord, you know our hearts. We want a fresh connection with you, Lord. We want to be true worshipers. 
Thank you that you come to us with good news, that you smile and you speak at the same time. Oh, Lord, be of good cheer. May we be of good cheer, not to be afraid. For the ones that stand, Lord, for salvation, we rejoice with them. Holy Spirit, circumcise their heart. Give them the faith as they make this decision for Christ. Seal them with the Holy Spirit. Open their eyes to the Word, their ears to where they can hear your voice, Lord. Thank you for salvation. Thank you, Lord. And for all of us that need to experience it again today, to be true worshipers, to have that heart to heart. Thank you, Lord, that we can come quickly to you when we sense our hearts getting hard. And for the others that stand, Lord, whatever storm it might be, with whatever category in their lives, Lord, set them free with your presence. Their situation might not change, but their heart to heart with you. Oh, Lord, we thank you. We do give you our country. We give you COVID. We give you all the stuff going on, Lord, around the world. Help us to be ambassadors of the King whose kingdom is sure to come. Please, Lord, please. And that very, very soon, I know you're going to beam us out of this place. So find us, Lord, watching, working, waiting, rejoicing in worship with a heart to heart with you. For the glory of Jesus and all God's people would say, amen. You guys want to congratulate these guys, Stan? Mm -hmm.